I even pained for Ida. These gods from another place that came to this world. But they wouldn't. They wouldn't return my feelings. They loved you, Ovan. Not me. You! Kun invites us to do the Chim Song quest, which reactivates Dr. Kubo's Chim Gathering. After last game in the Disappearing Chim, he decided to create a free-range farm for the purpose of researching enhancement of natural Chim cultivation, only to now find them all gone. Kun seems pretty out of it as we're beginning this quest too, repeatedly noted through the quest, as once more we find a dungeon completely absent of Chim in the environment. Eventually we corner one and follow it back to its compatriots, who are holding a special festival in Ka Shibajur. Kuhn explained the relevance, that Chim's naturally gathered from the Earth, and periodically the Chim Chims release it back into it in a pseudo-cycle of life parallel. But this leans into why Kuhn's been bummed. See, the girls we've seen him with several times? Because he's been busy and mulling all over the Ida stuff, he got dumped. By both of them. Wait, was he actually succeeding in a relationship with two women at the same time? who both knew of each other and were okay with that? Essentially, what is most of the straight male population's fantasy? And the only failing was you were too busy being part of a team that was effectively in charge of saving the world and not being able to tell them that, so they perceived it as being too busy with the game and not them? Wow, I can really understand you feeling you screwed up. I mean, it's implied it's the same girls we've seen him with previously on multiple occasions, showing he's faithful, if still a pervy skirt chaser, but what could have been a decent character moment about devotion to the ones he cares about and a callback to my coming off of that is hurt by him then going to flirt with another female player he's familiar with. Yeah, yeah this game sadly has a lot of those. A general lack of feeling of closure for far too many main cast members. And I really don't see a good way of correcting that. I think... I think the acquisition of the Lost Weapons was intended to be that closure, but it comes far too early for it to be that, and nothing in Redemption feels like real closure for a number of the cast. Which, once more, explains why this is the weakest part of the trilogy. It doesn't botch the ending, far from it, but it just falls short of the expectations Rebirth and Reminisce set us up for, likely explainable in the heavy rewrites involved. And Terrace is the next opponent in the tournament, an obvious sign of worry considering the master-student dynamic that's developed. After all, it's that kind of thing that would give Sakaki grounds to disqualify one side or the other for their personal affiliation if he doesn't like the results. Likely why he did it in the first place. And Terrace likewise isn't as oblivious as he might seem about everything going on, but competing again has awoken the pride he thought burnt out. And now, like the other Ikolo members, it's begun to swallow him. But as I said, Sakaki is that petty, announcing his belief that he's thrown the match. <laughs> Silence! You dare dishonor our honorable match? Honorable match? Hmm. You must be joking. Haseo was suspected of cheating in the previous tournament. No, he wasn't. Even if he was, a precedent has been set by a previous Arena Emperor, and Emperor since his crowning. But no, this isn't to incite more of the audience to turn from their normal selves into his converts without realization, as cheating in online matches is something that drives every gamer up the wall. And in this case, he reveals the existence of the Epitaph PCs, framed as hacked characters, revealing Haseo's first reckless use of scathe against Bordeaux, that Yada had recorded. Granted, the common player these days wouldn't know of the epitaph of Twilight, the causes of the second network crisis, or the fact that the phases are natural parts of the game and pillars that help sustain and manage the data generated by the black box AI files. But that's what people like Sakaki too. They tell those ignorant of the full situation only enough to draw them to the conclusion they want for their agenda. And it's these kind of people that are the enemies to good productions. That's racist. That's sexist. This causes violence because people that commit violent acts play them, expose themselves to it, and so on. 
You have all heard the song and dance yourselves, and likely the series and stories you yourself are a fan of. Since you know the full context to it, you call out those people as blatantly wrong. Not because you're ignorant of the existence of such issues, but because that specific situation that's been cited in full context is not that thing. But it's only that one scene of Haseo using Scathe. Not that other competitors had them, not that a former emperor had them, not that it's the only way to stop those infected by Ida, nor that Ida can manifest as a similar form, which would also be illegal by his mandate, and thus completely Hippocratic by his team bearing them. Instead, he blames every other Ida incident, the Ida BCs, the coma victims, the entire Ida server that started Reminisce, solely on the actions and abuse of the avatars. And Ida has a new emotion to feast upon. Hatred. Is Haseo guilty? Or is he innocent? Yes, I see your opinion. I disqualify you and banish you from the Colosseum, as well as the world! Bastard! <laughs> yes, howl at me, you trash. Have you not realized yet? Your precious ideals no longer exist anywhere in this world. I wonder, Sakaki, do you ever tire of being wrong? Wait a moment. Taihaku! Yes, this is why it was important to establish Taihaku more than he was. Because he's met and knows Haseo's true character, from both the Forest of Pain and through Antares and previous Icolo interaction, and he himself has used a weapon that's blatantly unfair. So, by doing what he did to Antares, Sakaki has drawn Taihaku's ire, and broken him even slightly of his Ida possession to intervene. But it also reveals what Entrance has done. He's sided with Sakaki and Taihaku, joining the Emperor's Arena team, and thus, why Sakaki did not expose him in his footage, because it weakened his own platform. Haseo, however, can't believe after everything, they'd betray him so easily and completely, especially after returning Mia to him. And yes, Taihaku's intervention is framed in removing the sullying of the arena's honor himself. But notice the phrasing. If he's truly the cause, he would fail. But if he's relying on a cheat, on position, and pride, he'd fall. It's double talk. Though he's stating it in Haseo's direction, He's referring to himself and Sakaki. He knows what's going on, he just can't stop himself. And Sakaki can't see his plan just went off the rails. This was intended to be his endgame, to get Haseo gone or under heel by total demoralization. But a good plan always has a backup, and Team Hetero... Stop laughing! ...are up against him next, Sakaki taunting him with the confirmation of Ida's presence in them. And with the avatars declared by him to be cheating, it's leading to a dilemma. Though a good counter to Sakaki's one-sidedness, on the boards, there's active discussion and people already poking holes in Sakaki's speech and evidence, bringing up all that I did. Because, as I like to say, people are not that stupid. Antares invites us on a quest to defeat another oh. Keppel's misbehaving machina, the Moza machine, and recover his research, which is used as a backdrop to the Elder player reassuring Haseo, revealing that he was legitimately dominated in the match, the student surpassing the master, and still he held back. You know, Haseo, your avatar, or whatever you want to call it, might seem like cheating to many of the other players, and they're not gonna like it, but then you have a larger purpose, don't you? Something you have to do in the world. I use whatever powers I have to their full extent. That is my way. But I'm going to use my avatar however I like and whenever I like. I don't want to lose any more friends. Not ever again. Yes. Then you'd better get your head on straight. This quest reactivated Mecha Grunty, at least by holding account of the chims you give him. But as I train at a lot of higher levels, 
and because the Chim, you need to give him are a far lower threshold this game, when I next went PK hunting, this happened. Yes, as you send him flying away this time in full power, he gets his own song, an expansion of the one you always hear play. Haseo's reaction to being witness to such is my own. And so, it's time for the final tournament match. And they are so getting wrecked in one move. 20 level advantage, bitch! Have I mentioned that Sakaki is a cruel man? He blames their torture on Haseo, encouraging them to attack him with everything they have to defeat him. Listen, listen to the cheers from this crowd. Lying, cheating hack Haseo and smash him to bits. Do so, and you will be the hero of the world. Do you think they really care about being a hero? My bet is they'd rather not be in fucking pain. The battle's as short as you'd expect, Sakaki reinforcing their anguish to bring out their Ida forms and revealing their suffering. Someone help me. And it's Someone the cry we should have been shown Haseo always responding me. to as his motivation in Roots, the underlying trait of his character. If you are in the world and cry out for a hero, the response will always be, I'm right here. I'm using the Avatar. But Haseo, if you do, Sakaki will... Shut up! To hell with Sakaki! I told you. I'll use the Avatar when and how I damn well please! It's unfortunate it's another Ida battle against the spider-styled Idas. This one dubbed Grundwald, who differentiated it from the generic Oswalds, showing more power in its blows but the same basic attack pattern. The deletion of Ida reverts the players back in appearance to their former forms, Sakaki disappointed, but unconcerned. So you've forsaken compromise in order to win. <laughs> Very well. There's no point in citation. I still have pawns that I can play. You really don't, you know. So now only the title match is left to end this farce. Adelie calls us, requesting we come on a shop quest with her. Uh, what is it? Nothing. I was just thinking about how many times we've been out adventuring like this together. Huh, yeah. Guess it's been a lot. The quest's goal is to kick the Silverman Kudan. It's so cute! Awesome! It's the gold bird! No, stop! You can't kick it! You'll hurt it if you kick it! At first you think, with the trend built up concerning quests, Hadley asks us on, this is going to end in disaster. Nope. Kick it! Huh? This quest is one more contrast, this time for Adelie. The events of it mirroring and diverging one of its key moments. She's more comfortable with herself, and willing to embrace the nature of the world and its intended fun, instead of the elements she's projected onto it. But the Silverman Kudon has a prophecy unveiled by its kicking, threatening disaster. A resurrecting demon, and the abominable army of death that follows and you are destined to take part in the great battle to come. And when all that must be done is finally done, you will have a surprising and unexpected encounter. A pretty accurate one, to say the least. Though it can be considered another piece of the Abyss quest just going to script. I like to think of it as some facet of the Lucky Animals programming allowing it to tap into the abilities of the Prophet. Least from it, Haseo has realized the impact of their experiences have had, and not just on himself. Of course, leading to shipper-baiting introspection. Adelie, was she always as cute as she is now? And I feel really relaxed whenever we're together. Maybe, maybe I'm the one who's changed. It seems like this, that our continuing to provide character development, or why I still really enjoy this entry a lot, even if it is the low mark of the trilogy. Sadly, this doesn't come up that much. 
It's nearing time for the title match against Team Taihaku, so in preparation, I kill Chaotix until Natsume shows up, fight the doppelganger again, and then max out Haseo's, Adelie's, and Kun's lost weapons, which to master require you defeat one final guardian for each of their powers, the Undying, the Undeceived, and the Unswayed, essentially monsters immune to the concepts each phase of the Epitaph is attuned to, which you also have to fight for the other four lost weapons. Which leads us to the final match. Now, Taihaku! Turn Haseo into rust on your sword! You just watch! I'm gonna make Haseo get down on his knees in front of Master Ren! He'll be crying like a baby the whole time! And you wonder why people outright despise her character. There's no need for you to do anything. Yeah, the other two really don't get involved. For Taihaku's pride comes from his solitude, that while he respects others, he does not need them to succeed. Haseo, how will you answer the power of my blade? For as I said, Taihaku's pride has, ironically, protected him, reawakened by Sakaki's actions, so even as the man eggs him on. Shut up! For their ultimate strategy is not to end Taihaku. His infection is by proxy. What needs to be destroyed is Maxwell itself, the sword he covets as his source of strength. But a weapon is easily removed. Kun, do it! <sighs> right! However, Sakaki's final trap springs, and thus, the final test. Will you give in to the darkness of yourself? Haseo, no! 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 The answer is no. By force of will alone, Ida is ejected from him and deleted. But that act has rendered Haseo completely exhausted, and with no one to stop him, Sakaki inserts himself to finish the job, using a system administrator status to eject the rest of his party. A oh, pity then, he forgot to do the same to the other side. Die, Haseo. Die! What? Because this was his plan all along? There's no chance in hell Endrance would betray Haseo after he helped him get Mia back. No, seriously, Endrance foresaw that going at him all from a point of open antagonism would make it so they were always one step behind. So, when he heard word of the tournament, he used his status as a former emperor so as to sidle in with Taihaku, thus capable of nudging things through his passive ability as the Temptress and wait to strike. Saku, however, everything she said, everything she did, was legitimately her. But Entrance's words captured the essence of why Sakaki is this story's villain. Your downfall was that sin appeared before you. Of course, that may not have been your fault, but... Giving yourself up to that sin was. And finally, the Ida and Sakaki surges, as he indulges fully in his god complex. This is Sakaki! God of the world! Foolish ones who oppose the will of heaven! I'll tear your PCs and minds into tiny little pieces! But Haseo's exhausted, and though he calls Skaith with the support of Endrance, he still doesn't have the power to manifest it. Good thing, they are not alone. Huh? Don't forget about us! No matter where we are in this life, nothing will ever be able to separate us! It's Take time. It, I am. And I. And I. And I'm right here! For you, 
Victorian is the last of the Ida forms, preferring scattershot and rapid attacks meant to overwhelm and dominate, but always leaves open a hole. Sakaki the entire time ranting and raving how he'll erase Haseo's existence on every conceivable level. But you cannot kill death. But that's... impossible. Upon purification, Sakaki's player character is dropped once more beyond the boundaries of the realm, the Ida server destroyed, and everyone's server-wide freed from its active influence. Andrids apologizes for the deception, but considering how it all worked out, it's forgiveness granted in spades. But, because this entry likes to rush us from one event straight to the next, Pai calls just as the match has ended and reveals she's found Yada. However, in the outer dungeons, Sakaki stews, once more unable to conceptualize his defeat, only to be approached by his benefactor. Oh, it's you! I did everything exactly the way you asked! I acted out your script precisely! Please, please give me a seed of Ida! I'll never suffer this humiliation again! Yeah, it's this line why I've repeatedly stressed that Sakaki's sins are solely his own. The thing about a script is, it's an outline. An outline of how you want things to play out. Those given the script are ultimately responsible for making it manifest through their own perceptions of reality. We don't blame the writer because the acting and directing is terrible. No, Sakaki was a monster before we had even met him. Ovan only allowed him to dig himself his own hole by tempting him with Ida, exposing that abhorrence for all to see. He didn't need to do what he did to the player killers, to Moontree, to his classmates, to Adelie, and ultimately everyone and thing he sought to conquer in his own mad ambitions to fulfill Ovan's own plans. Because Ovan doesn't care about any of that. He's responsible for the means and method. It looks like they're here. <laughs> Your Grim Reapers. Not the execution. And thus, justice comes, burning, blowing, and surging with an azure light. Sakaki is! Sakaki is! Sakaki is! You know. I'm half and half on this end to Sakaki. On one hand, it is deliciously ironic that Sakaki would meet his end in the same exact way Sora did in R1. Data drained by these servants to the AI which command the system, and his player waking up later completely free of any memory of the world. Yeah, Toru will never regain his memories of being Sakaki. There is no Morgana Factor or Ida Remnant to capture the Persona to eventually return and reintegrate it. Sakaki no longer exists in any form. On the other, there is part of me that believes after all he's done, he should be made to suffer for the acts he's committed. Total oblivion is too kind. So we had to Raven by informing us that Yad is effectively shut down on a mental and emotional level, nothing appearing to get through to him. But with Sakaki gone and all his promises that incited Yada's sacking in the first place proving to be lies, Pai is working on correcting the latest of CC Corp's blunders. Ovan shoots an email our way, once more placing the blame for everything on himself, confirming that Sakaki's bluffs about spreading Ida en masse were just that. Similarly, we're sent a message from Taihaku as replacement to a coronation ceremony, a greater one coming in the works, and is to exposit on how, well, empty Taihaku's felt for quite some time. When you lose a passion that was too intense, how do you fill the void of powerlessness it leaves behind? I really have no idea. Back then, I didn't even try to fill that hole. All I did was run. But he admits what he's gone through has managed to fill it, even if he's screwed up along the way. But you know, this is the only way I know how to live my life. 
Hayaku thinks he's succeeded, and that's more than enough for him to grant him his proper status as ruler of Ikolo, the Sage Emperor's Room, and the Silad, the game's best broadsword, which is a level 135 weapon I could start equipping several levels ago. I leave Sirius and Alcade to you. Because they are his friends, and he cares for them deeply. Saku contacts us. And it's leading into her arc for the game, that I have already spoiled during the Reminisce review. That she's not really real. She came to realize after the title match that, well, she's not needed. Bo's got a better role model which can inspire him to stand up for himself, and Andridge clearly is not going to return the affection she places on him. So she tells him what she is, and intends to leave Iori's online adventures to their care, and not willing to listen, despite Haseo's refuting of her words. After all, all he's seen, at least when she isn't gushing over entrance or denigrating himself, is a bratty girl that does appear to care for her brother. Hell, what set off meeting Iori is Bo trying to buy a gift for her, the girl that exists solely in his head. But Haseo, I was never supposed to exist. I'm no longer needed. Not needed? Don't be so stupid. There's nobody in the whole world who'd be sad if I wasn't here. And now begins, well, what is a divisive series of chainmails for many? See, you can either encourage or discourage her from fading into nothingness through the responses you send her. And before you think, is this more of a direct Paragon Renegade thing with how you treat people in dialogue options? Yeah, sort of, but I take this view with it. You'll remember what I said about Adelie meeting Sakaki on a suicide website? Well, people go to those and exposit other dialogue to that kind of effect other places as a cry for help. That they don't want to do it, but don't see many other options. At least that's my understanding, I do apologize if that's wrong. But it at least informs why Saku even bothered to tell anyone. On some level, she knows she's wandered around but her own issues are burying it. And by releasing that to people, they seek out reassurances that life is worth continuing to experience. That the existence itself matters, can matter, will matter to someone. That as often as you get nice people trying to advert it, you get the assholes that have no sense of empathy for others that encourage them to do it. And that's the dilemma and the morality play posed here, and given organically. It doesn't matter that Saku is a split persona of a person that will continue living afterwards. She is still in the same allegory as Adelie, a person with problems, imagine or not, wanting to cease to exist. Now admittedly, I don't like Saku, mainly because 90% of her interaction with her makes her out to be a total bitch, which sunders the time we spend with a nicer person. But that's the judge of character here, actually reflective of the player's own morals. Are we just going to egg on and encourage someone to kill themselves, not because they have done something actually abhorrent and wrong, but because we don't like them? You know, there are a lot of individuals I dislike that actually deserve an ironic fate dealt to them that don't get it, but even if this is a pre-programmed, pre-decided narrative, Saku is not one of them. So, that's my answer. I choose the email options that encourage and point out to her why it's not worth going forward with her plans. And there's a lot of good exchanges from the ones you're consoling her over, including a line from Maseo that his knowledge on the meaning of flowers... You know, the whole honeysuckle thing? Well, it goes further than that, explaining the meaning of the white chrysanthemum to her, which inevitably gets her to stay. It's sad that a lot of good character moments in this entry only show up in the emails. But as we log off... Pi informs us that Yada's escaped from the Watch of Pi, and needs some help tracking him down. You know, I kind of wanted to see an animated sequence that showcases Pi's hunt. Where did he hide out in the first place? Why did he decide to leave his home? And where the hell did he get a cheap apartment in Tokyo? Have you seen their prices? Eh, considering he's just now logged on and gone to an area, maybe he went to and hung her down in an internet cafe. He's met by Ovan there who admits that getting Yada out of GU was part of the plan, mainly because he's the last Epitaph user, and shows no signs of awakening, so had to force his hand. 
blessed by Ara and Ida both. I wasn't chosen, even though I love them so much. No. 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 No, no, no! Ah! This kind of seems like an overreaction, and it kind of is. Not help that it's compounded by the phase, but we've seen Yada. Wise men now will be... No. We've seen Takumi Hino throughout the series. He's existed in one form or another in this world since Fragment. Has logged more hours than Kaoru did to be with or try and find Mia. Has endeavored to find and be a part of uncovering almost everything about this realm. And still he's passed over. Morgana traps Tsukasa in the system. He doesn't even learn about it until later. Aura awakens and the bracelet is passed to a bearer. Oblivious until they search him out. Multiple vagrant AIs wander the world. Never finds one on his own, and is completely oblivious to Mia's nature. He is key to closing the events of the Sacred Network Crisis, forgotten by all but those that want to use him in reality. Aura has a child, loses her, and when reunited decides to leave, is a bystander throughout. The system crashes, and he sets up to learn the world again, and he's passed over. Forgotten once more, until CC Corp comes to use him. And after he deciphers another mystery, he's presented with more and more fragments of its legacy that go to other people, could have been his, should have been his. Well, the one he was able to grasp and take he can't even begin to understand, can't begin to connect to, is outright rejected by it. And then, Takumi has what he wants, the best way of finally achieving his goal and unlimited time to try, it's callously stolen from him and given to a petulant, spiteful brat that they say can do his job better than him. He wants the world, and it doesn't want him. It doesn't see him. In spite of everything, every detail, every secret, every line of code he's unraveled to make himself stand out to it, be recognized, and have his long, endless hours validated... He is ignored. To the world, to Aura, he is minuscule, unnoticeable, unimportant, unworthy of even acknowledging he exists. Now it's no secret Stephen J. Blum, or Bloom, I've never had my pronunciation corrected one way or the other, is my favorite actor, and is typecast in about three ways. The suave gentleman, the aggressive brawler, or the malicious mastermind. It's very rare in his career to have one that defies those. But, with those kinds of roles, it is even more rare to hear him portray someone emotionally breaking down. And he sells it. He sells the sobbing lamentation of a man that just wanted to be accepted by something he saw greater than himself, that he had devoted so much of his life to. A realm capable of bringing forth True, sentient life. Even if this is not my favorite role, is it any wonder I am a fan of his? Pi is now in charge of GU, having secured the rights to its management while every executive was busy blaming each other over Sakaki, quickly using the Serpent of Lore to find Yada, as at last his phase begins to manifest. Which, ironically, seems to be the most volatile awakening. Admittedly, we never got to see Ovon, Enron, Kuhn, or Pies, and three of those were done without the influence of Ida. But it might be because he's likely spent the past few weeks doing nothing but trying to figure out where the hell he went wrong. As we arrive, Fidel fully emerges, and I kind of dig it's GU rehash, once more having the plant styling many of them do. Quadra Halos turns the discs that surround the Prophet into laser cannons, Spinning Death, the expected energy discs, and Will of the Gods? Well, I can't really describe it very well, but it's got style, and a thankful departure from a majority of the other redundancies of Avatar battles. And of course, Data Drain shows itself as a massive disc Fetel forms the center of. We drain the Prophet, meaning, yes, aside from a small chunk of Corbinic, Scathe has devoured all of the other phases of the Epitaph of Twilight. But as Fetel begins to collapse, he 
as his name implies, foresees the path the world is headed towards, relayed through Yada. The aberrant key born in thy left arm. The key of twilight born in thy right arm. The final wave, the surge of rebirth, shall become light and fill the world. As the stirring footsteps of a giant shadow sound. That doesn't sound good. And gels far more than I expected to the warnings of the Silvermane Kudan in hindsight. But whatever, we'll deal with that later, as Yada is still not in a good place emotionally, having his own pity party. And it's not Haseo that snaps him out of it. We're merely bystanders, as Pi confesses she cares about him. A lot. There's a reason Pi calls him Master. She has a great respect for him and his capabilities that likely go far beyond a professional level due to how closely they've worked together, and his laments and pig-headedness about no one caring, of course, makes her angry, as he's not even tried to connect, not recognizing the people around him trying to do it in turn, as he's only focused on the recognition that originates from a game. Isn't that because you don't even try to accept the love other people give to you? Listen to me. You are not in this world alone. I... After all, she lost someone she cares about to this damn game already. She's not going to let another one do the same. And she takes him to hopefully knock some sense into him. Hopefully, some sex. What? You were all thinking it! But as this event closes out, we segue over to Ovan, content that this is finally nearing its end, as he returns to Aina. Aina. Ew, crap. Is living dead moving on their own? This is generally not a good sign. I cut myself off from everything in order to keep going. But what's really important to me, the one who made me realize what's important... Haseo? Oh, uh, nothing. <laughs>